Uh, we're going to talk about surgical principles in avoiding treatment failure. This is my impression. We're here to learn from each other. This is not gospel. This is what's worked for us now for about 20 years. And what we've learned, what we've learned from doing a lot of revision surgery. Um, so uh, looking at the principles, of course, we have to make sure there are none of these associated disorders. I won't read them to you. You've heard of most of these today. There are quite a few. So Chiari is complex because there can be a number of these other disorders present. What is the pathophysiology? If we're going to recommend treatment, we have to understand what it is we're trying to treat. Uh, the three key components of uh, Chiari pathophysiology are obstruction of CSF flow that you've heard about, uh, compression and deformation of the medulla and uh, the upper cord. This is a very abnormal medulla. It should be not this long. It shouldn't be narrow here. It shouldn't have this kink at the end, and we'll talk about this as we go along. We want to treat that. And we want to treat the deformative stress, and I'm going to hopefully show that to you a bit later on, that occurs with each heartbeat, which is 100,000 times a day. And of course, we have to consider other disorders that we've talked about, tethered cord, syringomyelia, instability. This is a happy situation. This is, there's no crowding. No one would call this anywhere near Chiari malformation. This is a descent of the cerebellar tonsils close to C2. Uh, if you draw a line from there to there, the hole at the bottom of the skull, there's really not much space for CSF to flow. But Chiari uh, is very variable. Here's a worse uh, increased case, a long stretched out medulla, the cerebellar tonsils, which kink kink and a butt, the tubercles of the gracilis and cuneatus nuclei, and use that to stretch that medulla. I hope to show that to you a little more. Here's another. You, someone might diagnose the Chiari as herniating here. This is not at all the cerebellar tonsils. This is an important part of the spinal cord. The tonsils have kinked on this with each heartbeat. It is pistoning, it is stretching the cord, and in a crowded frame, and as you see, you have a waist deformity in the medulla instead of being plump here. Uh, here's another case. We've all learned to think of the Chiari malformation as a uh, axial, uh, I'm sorry, as a sagittal disorder, a side view disorder. That's what we've been taught, but it's much more than that. The definition is only using this side view, and it's stayed around. You've heard that issue. So we need to look at other views. This is an axial view, cross-section view. And we see that the tonsil on the left is rolled around into the region of the lateral cerebellar medullary cistern. We just are getting more information. We can use a coronal view, the crown view, this kind of crown. And you can easily tell that the left cerebellar tonsil is more plump and more, a bit more descended than the right. So it's a three-dimensional disorder. Here's, I think, hopefully, take that point home with you, we need to look at the cross-section views. This is the tonsil on the right. We see, I'm sorry, this is the tonsil on the left. We see the tonsil on the right to be much larger. It is in about 60% of cases, and it is torquing that medulla. It is rotating it, and none of these factors have been put into the, what Chiari is or the definition of Chiari. We just look at this five millimeter number, if you will. Now, uh, I'm going to show you a few surgical images. I think you can manage them. Um, we can open up. The patient's head is here. They're looking face down. The feet are here. This is the surgeon's view. The dura is open. This is the arachnoid that you've been hearing about. We can see that the right tonsil is crowding out this uh, tonsil over here. That's an upset tonsil from this one. Um, and you can see why in some people doing an extradural approach certainly wouldn't manage that, because even an intradural approach, this tonsil wants to come out and wants to use that space. So yes, we're going to have to shrink especially this tonsil, reduce its size. 
Uh, tonsils, you know, the brain is hurting itself. You know that some neurologists don't uh, recognize this condition. Maybe you know that Dr. Kula is, uh, I think, the world's pioneer neurologist that does understand this condition. But this is repeated pulsations, and these are calluses that have developed at the tips of the tonsils. These are more normal looking vessels here. These are abnormal, they're stretched out. Now this is a callus at the tip of the tonsil. It's just like wearing a tight shoe and you look at the tips of your toes and you can't take the shoe off. There's gonna be that little white area to it. This is a blister. So some people's tonsils are going to blister. There's a name for this. It's called cystic degeneration of the tonsil, but it was a, it's a blister. And this uh, lady present to me, and I convinced myself that yes, there's clearly a Chiari. The medulla is very elongated. It, part of it's in the spinal canal. Uh, and I thought this was gonna be an arachnoid cyst. I hope you can see it there, um, that white pocket. So this is surgery, just initially getting in there. It's on the right side. I'm just starting to look. I'm starting to roll that out look at it a bit more. This is part of the tonsil. This is a cystic degeneration of the tonsil. So I'm gonna enter that, let the fluid drain, shrink that down, and we can give more space. So the brain is hurting itself. Um, I'm gonna bend your mind just a little bit. This is the typical view that uh, we're used to seeing. The Chiari ends there, not there. This is part of the spinal cord. Um, I'm going to bend your mind just a little bit. This is the surgical position. We're not maybe as used to seeing it in the surgical position. This is pretty much neutral here. So this is what the surgeon is going to see. So the surgeon is going to go down and remove some bone, C2. Let's see if the other pointer might be better. Um, they'll remove, I'm sorry, some of C1. And then there's going to be the dura, the sac. And then oftentimes they'll put an ultrasound in to get a little video. And that is the ultrasound. So that's 100,000 times a day. That's going on as we're watching it. Here's that, the tubercle of the spinal cord that I talked about. This happens ongoing. The dontoid, the dens that you've heard about, it is uh, affecting that in the area. Thank you so much, Paula. I appreciate that. Oh, well, Roger, and you guys, awesome. Um, so, uh, can you, now, not everyone, and I think if we're trying to define this disorder, but we've not put motion, because this is very variable. Some people will hardly pulse in this area. Maybe they're just flat out too tight, and other people will um, be that dramatic. And Chiari can change over time, okay? She's 54 years old when she finds out she has Chiari. I think you can recognize that. She's a self-employed attorney. She's not about to quit work. She works for 10 years and then says the last year, there's no way I could push through. This is her scan 11 years later at the age of uh, 65. The brainstem is markedly elongated. There's a new syrinx. The tonsils I measured to four more millimeters descended. This is one year after surgery, so fortunately a lot of times we can reverse this abnormal pathology, and of course she's gonna feel better with that brainstem instead of that brainstem in the syrinx. So it changes over time. So surgical principles, my overriding surgical principle is you treat the choke point. Think of it as the choke point. It helps us focus what our job is. And the choke point is this funnel, which was a funnel was mentioned earlier today. This is where the pathology is. This is what we need to relieve. It's not up here. How do we do that? Uh, what are our goals? They've been mentioned. One is restore normal flow, relieve neural, tra uh, neural tissue compression and deformation, and at least if they have a syringomyelia, you need to relieve obstruction at the foramen of Magendi, and I'll show that in a bit, if an obstruction is there. So our goal is obviously to take this scenario, a very abnormal medulla, Chiari, crowded, and then a year post-op, ideally, not everyone uh, gets to that point, we want to return them to that situation. Here's another. Uh, before, long, kind of straight 
versus a more natural course in this area once it's relaxed. So avoiding surgical failure. So in treating uh, revision patients now for many years, these are the seven areas that I've identified for me can be a problem, can be the cause of the failure. And unfortunately, sometimes it's more than one step. So I'm gonna take you through these steps. And number one is the extent of bony decompression. Uh, my philosophy is to create a bony decompression as close to the width of the foramen magnum as allowed by anatomy. Now I know some surgeons do less, and they comp or what they do then is do more internally. So that's a philosophical difference, but this is my view. Uh, make it as large uh, ana anatomically. The length of the decompression varies two and a half to three centimeters, again, depending on on anatomy, if you're gonna take C1, which I need to in most cases, take it to the edge of C1. And I'm gonna show you some examples. In the literature, this is probably the closest illustration I've seen to what I personally do, that I lectured at the a second ASAP meeting, uh, I think it was in Los Angeles, if that's. But the textbooks will tell us that here's a Chiari, here's how you do Chiari, here's how you do Chiari. This to me is an over decompression. This is an under decompression. We're gonna look at scans that I've seen for over decompressions that have come in. This is an under decompression. So let's look at under decompression and what the issues are first. So this is an extradural uh, decompression. Uh, these folks, some of these folks can do well for three to six months. Then the, the, the scar builds up. These tissues get tense, they don't expand, and they obviously come back 29-year-old with worse headache, dizziness, vertigo, et cetera. This is her CT scan. Again, the dura was not open, but the bone was also small. This is surgery. So she has um, adequate in terms of width, but basically um, 11 or so, maybe 12 millimeters of bony decompression. Um, I, reop I opened the dura, the dura had not been opened, uh, sewed in, I always use, almost always use a person's own tissue, pericranium, with um, non-absorbable fine stitching, and uh, this is where we need to be in a revision surgery, and people asked about adhesions, and I agree. If we have enough CSF bathing around this area, then these two surfaces aren't gonna find each other to be sticky. I'll talk about reconstruction here later on, but keep in mind that reconstruction, for me, allows more muscular support of that area. This is another under decompression, um, reasonable side to side, off center a little bit, but a fairly small uh, craniectomy. I extended that into about three by three. That's the dura. Um, this is a, a post-op situation in a revision. Um, over decompression. Now, frankly, over decompression is disabling. This, to me, some of the, these folks have some of the uh, most difficult problems when too much bone has been uh, removed. Woman in her 20s, uh, she is a student. Uh, she cannot work, she cannot go back to school, she cannot drive. That's her decompression. On first look, you think, well, yeah, I've seen that in the books. Um, but uh, she sees her surgeon uh, at a top academic U.S. hospital, and the surgeon says, you're wide open. Uh, there's nothing else to do. Your Chiari is fine. She sees another neurosurgeon in the same large city. Uh, you're wide open. She doesn't see anyone for a while, makes her way to our uh, clinic, and I said, you're wide open. And then I said, do you mind if I touch that area? Oh, I don't let people touch that area. But she traveled away, so you just put your fingers gently on that area, and you just gently give a little push. And she went like that. And her mother's eyes went like that, and for the first time, we understood the mechanism of her headache. Her inside brain world is connected to the outside world. There's only skin in between. You can pressurize her. Yes, they can tell when the weather's going to change. They feel the barometric pressure much quicker. And I, this is the first one I did. It was many years ago. And I said, you know, 
you're wide open, but I think you're too wide open. And I can rebuild that. I've, I've got a standard plate. I can ask my company to build a bigger plate, and we can rebuild that. Well, this is the cross-section view, spinal fluid scalp. Uh, this is what I found, a big blowout, a huge duroplasty. I had to do a reduction duroplasty, take that triangle out. These are some of the arachnoid adhesions that you've been hearing about. I broke those down. I had the company make a, a larger plate for me. Uh, this is before, this is after. Um, Um, so following this surgery, she sends me her graduation certificate. She decides to work in the neuroscience unit that treated her. She then sends me her wedding announcement, and she's had two children. A total life transformation from over-decompression. Another over-decompression, there's no muscular coverage here. The cerebellum has slumped. So I've got to, re I've got to build that back up. Here's a most recent one. Uh, it looks like the textbook that I showed you. She cannot work unless she's in a recliner supporting her head because she's got no muscular support. And this is a very high functioning uh, early 30s year old woman. So she, uh, then I have the company uh, make bigger plates for some of these wide decompressions to try to reduce them. Um, so now, to summarize on that, some people have over decompression and under decompression at the same time. Too much here, in my view, not enough at the choke point. Look at the C1. If you're gonna go in and do a laminectomy of C1, take C1 to the edge before you get the bone. This is her CAT scan. She is still crowded at the choke point. The choke point is here. It's easy to take this bone off, especially with a saw. The work is here. Uh, same, th here's the CT. I think this may be another patient. Um, all right, here's, a, here's an over and under decompression. The choke point is still not taken care of. C1 is there, no muscle coverage. We'll talk about how to deal with that. Then the question is, what do you do with the dura itself? And my philosophy is, if you're 14 years or older, it's better to open the dura. I can understand when they're younger that the risks of leak are higher, and I have great respect for those that treat those little ones, okay? But um, in 14 years or older, we now, over a decade, run about 2% leak rate, and they're treatable. I treat them if they leak. Um, so um, big decompression. So she has a big bony decompression, as you see. The dura is not opened, and what happens in some people is these tissues thicken, they get inelastic, and their headaches come back in three to six months. This is MRI. There's essentially no. This is the cord. There's essentially no room behind the tonsils. We're going to reopen up. We're going to open up the dura. We're going to sew in a patch, and. Thought I had a post-operative, but maybe I don't right now. Management of the arachnoid. If you leave the arachnoid alone, which houses the spinal fluid, then you might have less chance of leak and less chance of infection. So if you're gonna do an arachnoid sparing operation and just do a dura repair, that's fine. Just don't make a hole in the arachnoid. So this is a college student. She's trying to get uh, back to school. She had uh, an arachnoid sparing operation, and the key for those of us that see patients that uh, have had previous surgeries is read the op note. And I noted that they left the arachnoid alone. She did not improve at all. She went back to her doctor. Neurosurgeon said, you're wide open. Um, I decided to do a Cine flow study anyway, although I agree, it looks pretty darn good. And, what it, and this was only a visible in a few slices. What is that? Right in the area that you wanted to decompress. I thought it was gonna be a cyst. So it was a subdural hygroma. Um, if you have wallpaper on your wall and you make a little slit in it and you stick a hose, that wallpaper is gonna lift up. So if there, she had actually two holes in her arachnoid, spinal fluid, float out, push the arachnoid back down on the tonsils, giving her, her essentially back her symptoms. 
The treatment is you just take all that out, all that arachnoid. These are uh, arachnoid before and after and improve her situation. This is another one and she was not doing well uh, this following surgery. Um, something about this area to me looked wider and I kept going back and forth and looking at it. And this is her intraoperative, that's the dura. She had a subdural hygroma, that's the arachnoid. You take the arachnoid out. We need to limit blood spill, uh, and if the tonsils remain impacted, we can reduce them. Um, but once we're inside in the dural area, to me, especially if syringomyelia is present, we're going to look for a veil over the fourth ventricle, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you examples. Um, so reduction of the tonsils here, obviously, I open up in this severe uh, Chiari case. Tonsils is kind of like, well, thanks, I needed that room. I have to reduce the tonsils. Uh, this is the fourth ventricle. These are the tubercles, or at least one of them, that they often get caught on and stretch the brain stem. And again, what's gratifying, maybe I've shown this one before, is the recovery. But this is the key to me, and that is, um, and I, unfortunately, I, I've seen a bit too many of these, maybe five, six, which frankly, with, so they've had a Chiari decompression. It looks reasonable. The syrinx persists. So what are you going to do here? You could put a stent in, um, et cetera. But I read the op note, and they didn't say anything about looking at between the cerebellar tonsils. And if we're there, I just believe we need to look whether they have a syrinx or not. Uh, she had a few adhesions. I said, you know, you might have a few adhesions, but I don't think that's it. And I think the fourth ventricle is a little big. I get a little sense of fluid here. I think, there may, I think you may be blocked here. And so, yeah, there was small adhesion there. That's not significant. There was another one off to the side here. That's not significant. But then you look between the tonsils. So again, one tonsil's here, one tonsil's here, starting to look. You're seeing kind of the, I think you'll see it a bit better as we go along, but something's going on there. Um, maybe another view. I start opening that veil. Now we're seeing inside the fourth ventricle. This is a congenital veil, retained rhombic roof that occurred uh, with development and never opened up. Uh, now I think you can see inside the fourth ventricle quite nicely. That's a two-month recovery. That's a two-month recovery. So at least with syrinx, I think we should be routinely looking, if we're going to do a Chiari malformation surgery in 14 years or older, uh, I think we should be, re uh, here's another uh, retained, uh, it's op I mean a uh, veil, here's an uh, opening. These occur about 8 to 12 percent of people with syringomyelia. Here's one I just did a few months ago. She had a veil as well, did her Chiari decompression, nice response to the syrinx. And so um, once we're inside, one of the key issues that's uh, already been brought up by questions in particular is adhesions and how do you deal with adhesions. And there's a new type of MRI. Um, GE calls it Fiesta, but other uh, makers like Siemens have different names. So we use the word Fiesta MRI, but it might be different in your institution. But it's a high-intensity T2 MRI, and the data is gathered in three-dimensional volumes. So you, they pick the volumes that they want to look. This is a lady done in our city, in Denver, a good neurosurgeon, did her decompression. Uh, she improved for a while, went back to the neurosurgeon. He said, you know, you're, there's nothing else I can do. Um, went to University Hospital, same thing. Uh, came our way initially, insurance gave us a hard time. Her family doc actually was the advocate for her and allowed us to evaluate her. So um, I thought, you know, it's not too bad. I mean, really, yeah, there's small room there, but I need more. I need more information before I can say I can go in there. So I got a Fiesta scan, uh, detailed images. We could see the adhesions um, between the cerebellum and the duraplasty, various on both sides, leftover bone there. Uh, but it was these axial, these cross-section views. 
that uh, suggested there'd be dense scarring. I'm sorry I didn't bring my intraoperative pictures, they're still in the scope, but basically dense scarring of uh, tonsil to uh, the dura. So took that all down, this is post-op. Um, she was a very uh, sullen woman, um, kind of uh, tired of being moved around to different institutions, just sad looking. And uh, we treated her sometime before Christmas and uh, she sent me this, and she said, she pointed to all her family, she said, this is why I wanted to get better. So um, that's uh, the T2 uh, high intensity images are really helping us with adhesions. We now do them almost routinely in folks we see for possible revision surgery. Now this is a step I will take a little more time in. So uh, 13 years ago at the University of Missouri, Columbia, I thought, well, why aren't we reconstructing the bone that we're taking? We reconstruct everything. I mean, there are plates for whatever you want, facial, whatever. But somehow we weren't reconstructing. The Japanese had started using ribs and bone grafts, so there was other, there was other work to try to rebuild that. And I thought, well, why don't we just take some of these little plates here and have the company design a plate to fit over that. I've used that successfully now for uh, hundreds of cases, um, and I, uh, for me, it works well. Very few people might have thin enough bone, uh, inferior lateral, where the screws won't support, but that's only a few percent. Um, but before I get to the plate, uh, some will flip over the bone. They'll take the bone out and flip it over. Sometimes that works, but sometimes it doesn't. Here's a person I had to re uh, revise, uh, the bone had been removed, it had been flipped up, uh, upside down, if you will, the little tiny plates. Um, this is what I saw at surgery, you can see some of the plates here. Um, I just put in a large duroplasty at that time and uh, put my own plate here and at least open things up to get the person better. Um, other people are using plates, but but sometimes with these big proud plates, they can be an issue themselves. Uh, let's look at the um, MRI, and basically there's no central muscular supporting this. Uh, yes, the plate is protecting that, but there's no muscle coverage. And to me, that's an important principle. In, uh, so the plate, my standard plate is fairly straightforward. It's easy to bend, I can shape it. I put about a couple of screws here, a couple of screws down low, a couple here, or wherever you need to. Um, here's what it looks like on scan. People say, well, why are you gonna put a plate in? You just decompress. Well, no, you bow it over. You're reconstructing. This is my newer plate, has a midline to guide me. This is what we're trying to achieve. Decompress, and here's, here's plate in one case, this is a different case. They get musc the muscles will find that. So we're preserving some of the function of that musculature. And I think especially as we get older, when our necks go from this to reverse a lot of times, we're gonna need that support back there. So as I tell my patients, it's not essential, there are two reasons that I suggested it. If possible, it keeps you from having quite the sunken defect that you might have, and more importantly, hopefully long-term, it'll be better for your musculature. And this is the saddest one. I mean, there are a number of these that are sad, but, and I was academic for 20 years, or 21 years, so I respect that. It's, it's possible that the main surgeon is letting the resident surgeons that are high level, don't get me wrong, close the wound. My principle is that the surgeon performing the critical portions of your operation should be there for the whole case. That's just an opinion, okay? They may not, they may allow the resident to close, but we don't need to see this kind of business. And I'll show you some actual pictures. And that is the surgery might have been done adequate, but there's, again, and it wasn't an over decompression, it's just that the wound was never adequately closed. And some of these folks call it their hole back there. Don't touch my hole, if you will. And you can press down low and they'll allow you gently to feel that. And it's, that by the way, this is a difficult condition to treat that I've felt anyway. First time re I repaired her, I thought that she's from another state. I thought, you know, great, I'm very comfortable. 
She sunk back in. I had a plastic surgeon come in on the second uh, revision. She got a little bit better, but never great. So we just, we just don't want to go there. Here's what a scan looks like. That's their hole. Okay? That should be all covered with muscle, and it's not. And then the final principle, obviously, that all surgeons consider is we have to um, uh, avoid infection. I was taught, uh, one of my instructors was, a, he had been taught in the 50s at Yale University, and if I, with my glove, touch skin, in other words, skin that wasn't covered, he'd hit my hand and, uh, and you know, tell me, keep your hands off the skin, keep your hand. because back then, you had an infection, you were in bad trouble. Uh, Dr. Black also said, keep the blood in the body, John. Keep the blood in the body. <laughs> yes, sir, I will. <laughs> but avoiding contact with the skin. Here, and the reason this is, uh, very, it's tough. This is two, two operations that she's had previously. I think this was bovine pericardium. That failed. Somebody, uh, another surgeon laid an online graph. She developed a big hole, leaked through her skin. Bacteria got in. Uh, and this, these are tough operations, frankly, um, and frankly, the outcome is not that great. We can break these down, rebuild the area, but this is what lives in our skin. So I certainly teach my residents and assistants, keep your hands off the skin. You touch with your glove, even though you've prepped it, okay, unless you have a cover over it, even though you've prepped the skin. There are bacteria. You look at ultra micrographs, there are bacteria. There are bacteria hiding in those little crevices that are ready to jump out. Um, and so we just don't want, we want to leave them alone, basically. Uh, and uh, surgeons know these uh, guidelines, but here's a great review. It's in the GI literature, perioperative strategies to prevent surgical site infection, skin antisepsis, surgical hand hygiene, antibiotics, of course, keep them uh, normal thermic. If they are hypothermic, they're a little more likely. We don't shave the hair anymore as we did uh, before. We just clip, uh, increase the oxygen delivery, and then I use wound protectors, but make sure they stay on. And in, at least in GI literature, it's reduced surgical site infection by 50%. Um, this is a post-operative infection following a decompression. Uh, this was Gore-Tex. It's supposed to be non-stick. You can see the creamy coat of meningitis uh, that she had developed. Um, here's Gore-Tex stuck to the back of the spinal cord. It takes quite a bit of time. Finally, we were able to do it, put a plate in, and, uh, and some improvement. But again, uh, this is difficult. Uh, it's just my post-op uh, dressing at this stage. Uh, unfortunately, some people have multiple causes. This is a 300-pound, 19-year-old, very fine young man from another state who presented to me after two Chiari operations. One was extradural. In other words, don't open the dura. That didn't fail. His associate opened the dura. Unfortunately, that leaked, and no one did anything about this hole that was visible here. That leak caused this, um, leaked outside the skin, antibiotics for six weeks, mother for the first month, getting up middle of the night to rehang antibiotic bags. Uh, I just spent, well, a while back I spent, um, he was in the OR nine hours, probably I spent seven or a little more hours. Uh, I was going to uh, bring his uh, follow-up MRI, I was very excited to bring it. Um, insurance company is giving us a hard time. Um, so uh, we actually, let me, let me run this if it'll run. So basically this is this cord. This is again where we're operating. These are bubbles in the water basically. So the ultrasound is there and um, let's see if it'll start again. I'm not sure. And basically it is scarred and tethered, and that's why it took. And then I had to get a, he'd, they, they'd already taken a paracranial graft. So anyway, long and short of it is, I didn't have an MRI to bring you, but we did develop a few years ago uh, outcome studies specifically for uh, adolescents and adults. It's easy for you to fill out that if we use this widely, we might be able to compare techniques to other techniques. I can say all I want. 
but it has to be compared to other uh, techniques. We looked at 112, I'm sorry, this is our initial study of outcome. Our outcome was 84% at one year. First study to use this uh, verified outcome measure. And I tell my patients we might be doing a bit better than that because we're recognizing other disorders, but 84% is the number I know, and that's the number that I can fairly give. Um, I've described some of the, our views on some of the issues in this neurological research article. Um, but I did want to mention that a few years ago we developed an outcome scale specific to Chiari. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, if we use it uh, widely, then maybe we'll be able to compare. I know there are a few other outcome scales out there, but this is fairly straightforward and it's patient-specific. Patient it can give us and you an idea of what our chances are that your physical problems are going to be helped, your neurologic physical problems, social, functional, psychological. It's a fairly straightforward scale. The higher the number, the more trouble you're having. So we want the number to come down after surgery. So in this uh, young man that I mentioned with that huge syrinx and uh, infection, um, fortunately, even though we have not yet gotten a follow-up scan, his pre-op, uh, his scores have significantly decreased uh, just two months post-op. Um, and uh, so uh, there was a comment about um, the likelihood of uh, success following revision surgery. My gut experience, although I have not studied it, it's about 70% of significant. That doesn't mean well 100%, but where you can get significant improvement in the quality of your life. And with that, I think I'll thank you. Thanks.